from Toronto. My name is John Kyo, and welcome to the Future of Food 10 by 10 academic series. And in this series, I speak with 10 professors for 10 minutes to get their views on what's happening in the food industry and what their organizations are working on. And today I'm delighted to have with me in episode number two, Professor Lisa Jack from Portsmouth University. Hello, Lisa. Hello, John. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to have you, and I'm going to put you on the spot straight away. And if you could tell us in one minute or less, who are you and, and who is Portsmouth University? <laughs> I'm Professor of Accounting at Portsmouth University, um, but I also mainly research the food industry. And in the last five years, I've been particularly researching food fraud and fraud in the beverage industry as well. I mean, we particularly focus on the fraud aspect of food fraud. We don't think it should be a matter just left to the quality and technical teams. So we're looking at how you put good counter fraud measures in place from the top to the bottom of the organization. But we're also interested in following the money. I particularly teach forensic accounting. And it's one really interesting thing is that nearly all the cases that have been prosecuted in food fraud have been on false accounting or false record keeping. So sometimes you have to look around the food itself, not just at the food as the part of the fraud. So from that vantage point, uh, Lisa, what are you seeing as the key issues that the food industry is dealing with and, and how specifically are you addressing those? Are you, are you doing the research and training of new academics or training organizations? A little bit of both. Um, we do the training when we get the invitations to go and speak to people and to go and do the training sessions in industry. We build this in where we can into our forensic accounting program and into our counter fraud sessions, but mainly we're doing research in this area. So the two areas we're picking up on that are of real concern, both for regulators and for companies are around technology and around the cost benefit of actually investing in counter fraud and preventing food fraud. The problem in the food industry is always that it's fragmented and the IT is frankly all over the place. It doesn't join up even within organizations, let alone across supply networks. And obviously we've seen a number of technical and technology solutions coming up um, around horizon scanning, broad risk analysis, and of course blockchain. Now, my role is really to get people to think around this get think around the technology and what the problems are. Get beyond the hype and the possibilities of the tools. But if you're not careful, same with blockchain, all you're going to end up with is a fancy new filing system that works a bit quicker than your old one. Okay, it's more visible, but are you actually protecting the company? So the sort of questions we're asking are, what are the management controls you've got in place? How do you prevent it being garbage in, garbage out of any other technical systems? What are the potential people problems? What are the legal issues? If you're going to sign off a block, what exactly are you signing off to? Are you really going, your lawyer's really going to let you say there's no fraud in this situation? I mean, also, um, the new technology brings in new fraud opportunities. So how much of organizations are aware of the new fraud opportunities? And that worries me a bit because my experience is they've not really got a good handle on what the old fraud opportunities are either because they're looking at this as a food safety or a food quality issue. And um, the biggest problem I have is people saying we've got a certificate, so we must be okay. I'm a forensic accountant. I start with the certificate when I'm doing an investigation. And also what are auditors going to audit in the future? They're gonna to have to be able to audit those algorithms that are inside the technology. It's not just going to be a case of saying the outputs are okay, you're going to have to be able to think about, well, what are they actually put in place? So we're working with artificial intelligence specialists. I've got a really good colleague who does machine learning, we're working with cloud-based companies, and we're looking at other forms of distributed ledger that can deal with the complex situations of when you have multiple suppliers and multiple customers. Because at the moment, blockchain is quite good in short, integrated supply chains. But as my colleague says, um, can you deal with the chicken pie? when it comes to actually tracing everything. It's about can you get the good data. So those are the questions we're asking, and I can't say we've got very far yet, but we're at least asking the questions. On the other side, on the cost benefit analysis, quite often what I get back from companies is, um, well, what's the real cost of food fraud? What's the real cost of the crime? 
is there really a problem and should we invest the money in it? Well, of course, you've got your reputation and, in fact, your company to lose. You've got to think of the companies that went under because of horse meat. But what is it more generally? What's the economic impact? And that's what we're looking at as well. So you can use benchmarks, and we've done that and others, to say that this is the typical spread of fraud. This is the typical cost as a percentage of turnover. It's a surprising average of about 6%. We can apply that to industry, but that doesn't limit the food fraud bit. That's just all crime in the industry. So we're looking at getting more robust calculations based on economics of um, crime and how criminals act and what that impact has, both at a national level and an individual level, including when should an enforcement officer go ahead and investigate, considering that they've got budgetary resource problems that um, are going to constrain that investigation and whether they do that or a food safety one. So those are the sorts of problems we're digging into and for which we've got funding to look into at the moment. That's wonderful. So on, on the one hand, uh, you know, the forensic accounting side and on the other, you have the technology side. You, you mentioned I'm very intrigued from a forensic accounting perspective, uh, Lisa. I'm, I'm intrigued with, uh, with the notion of auditing the algorithms as well. Is it too early yet to talk about what you're doing in that area? I think it's too early to say what the entire profession is doing in that area. At right. the moment. I think we're really at the stage of people being aware that this is something they may need to do and that they need to get their minds around not just how something like blockchain works, but how, what the thinking is. So, in fact, what you're going to see is a move towards, I think, people being involved right at the start of the system being set up. Um, I know for some other big AI companies like um, Google DeepMind, they actually bring in expert auditors and um, consultants and practitioners when they're thinking about the ethics and the data collection and everything else that the algorithm is going to attempt to do. Um, there's one slight problem with this that somebody brought to my attention at our annual counter fraud and forensic accounting conference at Portsmouth, which is actually, it's artificial intelligence. They literally have a mind of their own. And of course, over time, they're going to do things that you didn't anticipate. They're not appropriate, uh -huh. they're something else. So I think essentially we're at a very basic stage because people don't really know, but we're looking at how you can at least automate some of the tasks of collecting the data for prediction, and then how you collate that and get the machine learning to start predicting where you may have problems. And of course, you've got a legal issue there if you predict a problem that doesn't really exist, or you fail to predict a problem. And I think that's where the whole industry is, not just us. It's sort of really grappling with those ethical and practical issues, whilst at the same time, just trying to work out how the tech is going to work. Now, Lisa, we, we have about 30 seconds for the second last question, but you mentioned about 6% of revenue was lost to all types of fraud. Is there a good estimate of, of, of that 6%? How much of that is food fraud? Virtually impossible to get the data. Oh. Um, you dig into it, um, a reasonable percentage. The work we're doing is actually to work out what, what actually goes into that cost. What should yeah. you be counting? And um, come back in six months, we might have an answer. Okay, wonderful. Lisa, the time goes uh, very fast. And, and uh, in the last 30 seconds, if you're up in front of 50 new academics, 50 masters or PhDs, and they're starting off their scholarly uh, journey, what advice would you give them? I'd say, look for a real world problem, look for the potential people problems. Don't start with the solution, start with the problem. There's too many people go in and say, blockchain is the solution, and then work out what it's the solution to. If you want to do really original research, find out what the problems are. And some of them are around some fairly basic things about how do I get my data from hundreds of suppliers in a chain, and then how do I trace it out to my 50, 60, 100, 200 customers? How do I know where that um, spice has gone, if you like? That's a really good example. Wonderful. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much to Professor Lisa Jack for your advice and your wisdom. Again, Professor Lisa Jack from Portsmouth University, she heads up the team there in forensic accounting, and they're doing deep research into technology and also cost-benefit analysis. So thank you so much, Professor Lisa Jack. Thank you very much, John. It was a pleasure.